Welcome to Cause of Craft. I'm your host, John Tilton. Why do we create? Where do our ideas come from? What does our craft say about us? These are the ideas we explore here on the show. Each episode, I interview a different guest, from writers and painters to musicians and filmmakers. Together, we investigate the creative process and the reasons behind why we create. Why is it important to find new ways to create? And where do we find inspiration to try new things? This is one of the many topics I covered with this week's guest, composer Amy Tanaka. Before we start, we'll hear a sample of one of her latest works, Shifting Pieces for Solo Piano. In this episode, we also discuss Amy's jazz background and its influence on her work, her process for developing themes, and the contrast between composing for television and creating a concert work. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And that was a sample of Shifting Pieces by composer Amy Tanaka. Thank you for coming on the podcast, Amy. Thanks for having me, John. So when composing a piece like what we just heard, where do you start with that? What's the first thing that you do? That's a pretty big question. Um, there, there's a couple starting points. There's the starting point of actually writing the notes. But before that, there's probably an even bigger starting point is getting the idea together and the project And that kind of actually informs a lot of decisions when you're actually writing. One of the biggest things is deciding who's performing the piece, because that can influence the way that you write or the style you write. If you know the performer pretty well, you can write to their weaknesses or strengths. So I was actually very fortunate in this case that I know the pianist very well. She's a good friend of mine, uh, Mavis Pan, and she lives right here in the city. So I was really, I I knew that I had the time um, and I was really fortunate to be able to go over to her place and have some readings, readings where I kind of bring what I have so far and play through it and talk about it and go through the process like that. So that was a huge thing in just setting up how I was gonna write the piece um, and a lot of decisions that I made early on. Um, She's a great pianist, so I knew she could handle a lot of different ideas that I kind of threw out there. And that's sort of like, I guess you could say it's like every composer's dream to have that kind of a situation where you can kind of work through a piece with somebody as you're writing it and kind of start to hear their interpretation of it as well at the same time, because that doesn't often happen. Like sometimes you'll write a song for someone you don't know very well, and you might get limited rehearsal time with them. So you're less inclined to try different techniques or something that you haven't done before because you maybe for safety's sake, or you want it, you just want it to turn out really well. um, So you might not take those kinds of risks. So this was an example where I just felt really comfortable from the beginning on writing it. So that was kind of like the start of the whole project. And then there's a lot of like technical things when I start writing musically, just like trying to get ideas, you know, playing things into the piano, trying to find something that works, thinking a lot about melody and texture. Writing in this classical style is, it's quite different from other genres that I've written in, in that there's a lot of development that keeps happening. So like if you listen to a classical piece, there's usually like a theme and then it kind of develops and there might be another theme and that develops. And it's usually not like, like in a pop song, you might have a verse chorus and a verse chorus and a bridge. So there's a lot of sections that really repeat more closely, but in classical music, there's more of a, each time something's repeated, there's often a lot of changes. And so we call it like a through composed style. So it just means that there's a lot more challenges in writing that 
where the development kind of just has to go a bit further. Yeah, so it's almost like you have this collaborator at the very beginning of the process, which is something that I didn't expect. Like, I would think, oh, the performer is a collaborator at the end. Mm -hmm. But here you're saying one of the better case scenarios is having that person with you from the beginning. Is that more unique to something where, like, if you're composing for an orchestra, is the equivalent working with the conductor ahead of time? Or is this, are you talking about something that's more with the soloist in a piece such as the one that we heard? Yeah, that's a really good question. And actually, that's a really good example of kind of the opposite scenario is when you have an orchestra, there's all these other considerations that kind of make that close collaboration impossible. Probably the biggest one is is budget, because in order to get all those people together in one room (laughs) for a rehearsal at the same time requires an immense amount of planning. And so it's actually pretty expensive, the rental of the space and all. And so often, if you're working with a large ensemble, or especially an orchestra, there's just very little rehearsal time to go over stuff like that. So, I mean, it really depends on the caliber of the orchestra, but it's not. that's probably not the space to experiment with things. And the conductor's yeah, it's, it, it's, it is possible to meet with the conductor ahead of time um, since they're directing the orchestra and how they're doing it. Um, but again, the getting that cohesiveness with everyone there, it's just really challenging when you have, when you're writing for like a large ensemble or something like that. So yeah, I, I do agree. I think that is something that is definitely more possible with like solo performers than it is with a large group. And you're also mentioning themes and ideas that kind of start before the actual writing of the notes. Do you find that you're constantly exploring similar themes in your music or do you like to explore something different thematically every time that you compose something new? Themes kind of come from it's interesting whenever you, you know, sit down to write something or whatever we're creating, we're always kind of drawing on our experiences from the past. So whether that's music we're used to hearing, music we've already written, you know, techniques that we know, we're always constantly drawing on those. So I think there's definitely a similar style that's kind of thread throughout a lot of my pieces that I'm seeing, you know, the the more that I write. um, And it's funny, if someone hears my stuff, they might say, oh, yeah, that really sounds like you. It's like, sometimes you start getting um, similar, not just themes or certain melodies, but like styles or or feelings that kind of come out a lot. And sometimes I'll I'll try to intentionally challenge myself and say, I'm going to write something in a different way. And that can come from like outside inspiration, just listening to different artists or going, if I go to a different concert and, and kind of hear different techniques that I haven't tried before, that's a great inspiration to kind of, to open myself up to really start to go in a different direction with the themes and textures that I choose. I think other creative people will relate to that because just hearing you talk about that, I think about writing and how I'll listen to a course about writing or I'll read someone's work and I'll see something like you said, a technique and just think, oh, I could apply that to something I'm struggling with. Or what would my work look like if I did something that was in that direction? It's cool always. I think when I interview different people on the show, even though our crafts are completely different, a lot of times there's something that that at the root of it, we're doing something very similar in the act of creating something. Yeah, for sure. I think that it's it's that kind of thing kind of threads through all the, pretty much any of the creative arts where we're constantly drawing on inspiration from our experiences, basically, I think. And, and I think it's an important thing to keep the inspiration going. And that's something that, you know, has been a little hard during COVID, but now that con- live concerts are going back, I definitely trying to get out there as much as I can, because I I feel like just for my own development, to keep constantly hearing new types of music and new styles. And that was something in this 
clip that we heard earlier, that kind of technique with with all the chords was something I, I hadn't tried before. And I had heard something like that in, in some modern classical music, but to kind of go out on a limb where, you know, I have like this melody in the right hand over the chords, I would think or, or consider it to be a little unusual to just have the chords kind of take over everything and just really bang them out on the piano. And that's kind of like a, you know, like a small risk. Oh, that's like a technique. I'm not sure if that's going to work, but it's something I went for. And so that was an example of just something new that I haven't done. And it's not really in any of my other pieces. When you talk about you're composing something, you're curious if, if it will work or not. Is that something that you're working with the soloist ahead of time to figure out if things are working? You're doing kind of tests or is that something where you're kind of holding your breath on the performance night to see if everything's actually going to come together the way that you envision it in your mind? Yeah, no, that's actually, that's a really good question. And it often for me depends on like what instrument I'm writing for. So in this case, because I'm also a pianist and so writing for the piano, you know, I could kind of test it out and play it all myself. But it is a very different thing to give that written music to somebody else and hear their interpretation. Like, it's always a thing like, are they going to feel it the same way? Like, is it going to make sense to them? Um, Like musically and emotionally, sometimes it's hard to know whether you're actually giving that information in the score enough so that when you give it to someone else who has no idea, who's never seen it before, never heard it before, um, and they're just playing the notes. It's always a a concern that I hope the emotions that I feel are kind of translating through to the notes and articulations that I'm writing. And I find that, you know, with piano, it's a lot easier because I I can play it ahead of time and know if it works with the, you know, in the fingers and it'll fit in the hand position. Other instruments, like I don't really play stringed instruments like violin or cello. So writing for those instruments is quite a bit of a challenge. Sometimes I'll call, try to call up a friend and ask them about a certain passage. I'm not sure about like, does this work? (laughs) Can you play it? Is it playable? in the fingering positions, um, because that's just something it's, it is a challenge for me to do that. And of course, then, then if you have like a string ensemble, it's really hard to, to just call up anyone and ask them to test that out. So there definitely are certain pieces where that's a big consideration in how much I know ahead of time, how something's going to sound. And that, that just comes from experience. The more I write for strings, the more I kind of see what works and what doesn't. Um, And then I know, okay, I'll fix that. And so there's a lot in in terms of growing as a composer. Yeah, that's interesting too. Another kind of link here with the writing is I always consider the reader is in a way the end collaborator in something that I'm working with because what comes to life in their mind isn't always on the page, but I have to lead them to that. And so when you were explaining that and that kind of like, you don't quite understand if the audience is going to connect with it, or like you were saying, you're not quite sure if the musician is going to play it in the same way that you're feeling it. Like I can relate to that in terms of is someone who reads this going to picture what I want them to picture, or at least picture what's important in the scene? Are they going to feel those emotions the way I want them to feel? And like you said, it's a lot of times you don't know, and it's it's a matter of getting experience by doing it. But you know, sometimes someone experiencing it, or in your case, someone playing your music, they might come up with something that that you didn't imagine, and then it's it ends up carrying the the art to maybe a different height than you were originally expecting as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's that to me is one of the most exciting things about it is is it's a living, breathing thing. It's not just like you know, like you write, you write words on a paper um, and that's it. But it's, you know, it's someone reading it and everyone pulls their own life experience into whatever they're, they're looking at, you know, and it all comes out through them and they're different from us. So it's always going to have a slightly different 
meaning for each person. And that's one of the like really exciting things for me. Like when you see your work performed um, by somebody else is you're seeing it through their lens, really. You know, even though like for piano, like a lot of pianos kind of relatively sound the same um, without being like nitpicky about it. Um, But if you had two different people playing the same exact piece, the same notes, it can sound really different between those two people. You could get a, you could get a totally different performance. And so that's what I, what I love about it is that it's, it's alive. It's not, it's not something like, like you write it and that's it. It's just, it's something that can't be moved or changed. Um, But a lot of art, you know, in the interpretation itself is also another art form in and of itself. And so there's just a lot going on in terms of, you know, taking in all of this um, emotion from whether from it's the, the composer or the writer or the emotion of the performer, there's a lot going on. And that's why I think it's, it's so exciting, especially seeing live concerts. So when you're writing the score out to a piece of music, are those thoughts influencing how much you add to the notes in terms of how something should be played? Because I know, I don't know specifically what your approach is, but I know just from studying different classical composers that there's kind of a wide spectrum of, you know, like if it's Mahler, he might have like a bajillion notes, you know, Mm -hmm. for exact precisely how to do every single (laughs) little thing. I guess, where do you fall on that spectrum? I think in this case, especially writing for my friend and going through a lot of it with her, I kind of learned that not necessarily writing more notes, but more articulations and directions is something that I developed doing more recently. And that's probably because of my jazz background. Um, playing jazz is there's not much direction at all <laughs> in terms of how to exactly play something. So coming from that background and then writing for classical, I kind of had to learn, yeah, the, the performer can't read my mind <laughs> and they're not going to always get the emotion I want unless I really write in you know, crescendo here, forte, like being more specific, even just using words like play it like a Bach Baroque style, or, you know, even just directions like that can really help a lot. And so I do actually now write a lot of that in the score just to help with interpretation. Um, It might not be something that's done by everyone, but I think certain composers get their feel for what kind of communicates a certain articulation or certain sound for different sections of their music, because it is really hard sometimes to convey with just the general articulations that are available in standard music. So sometimes you do actually have to just write out specific directions like that. So I do tend to do that more recently. And you mentioned your jazz background. So I've always been curious with jazz, like you hear, oh, jazz, and there's improv with it for a typical piece. And I'm sure there's a lot of variation here. But what do the musicians go into having in front of them? What part of the score and and how much of that is improvised in the moment and, and how much of it might change depending on who's performing it or the performance itself? Yeah, so jazz, um, it's very closely related to composition, I feel. It, there are different types of improv, but when you're talking about like traditional jazz, like let's say Charlie Parker or like that that era, um, it is pretty structured. There are, you know, for each song, there's like a form. So that's like exactly how many measures and what harmony is played in each measure. And everybody follows that form. And then around it, there's a style. So each person kind of has their role. And and every instrument ha- kind of has their way to play around each other, like with each other. And usually the solos are kind of, they could be planned ahead of time. Like you could say, oh yeah, saxophone's going to solo first and then piano. And usually you just solo over the form, over the structure that's already there. So 
everyone can play behind you knowing exactly where you are in the in the piece even though you're making up the melody there is a pretty good structure for the traditional jazz i mean nowadays like there there is contemporary uh improvisation where even the form itself is improvised and harmonies sometimes there's totally free improvisation where a bunch of musicians just sit down literally just start playing anything and following each other but yeah for the traditional whether it's you know the the bebop era or traditional standard jazz there's definitely a lot of structure involved to me that's always like very closely related to composition because you're you're thinking a lot of the same elements like melody texture developing the melody um how to create emotional arcs, you know, how to intensify what you're playing. A lot of that is very similar to classical music where there's different techniques you can use to convey different emotions. And whether you're practicing on how to do it on the spot um, or writing it, it's kind of a circular thing, actually. Like the more I study music theory, you know, to help with different composing techniques, the more it can help improvise, like improvisation. It can help me like know what to practice for improvisation and how to make that better. And then the more I practice uh, improvisation, the more fluid my writing can be, the faster I can just kind of sit down and work out different melodies and ideas on the piano. So they both kind of inform each other in a way. It's a very like circular process for me. Yeah, almost like it's like a exercise or you're learning the language or or like you were saying before, techniques and different things that you can implement into it. Uh-huh, exactly. And and with jazz, different styles, there are different traditional voicings, uh, very specific um, styles and scales that are used. So those are all part of the preparation for improv is learning all of that um, so that you can just output it in different songs. And then classical kind of has its own harmonies. I mean, it's such a wide field right now. Classical is probably one of the oldest music forms. It just spans hundreds of years. And then modern classical, you know, it's still being created. So there's just so much to draw on in terms of inspiration and techniques and different harmonies. Um, A lot of classical composers use a lot of jazz harmonies in their writing, Um, and I do that too. But you wouldn't necessarily know it because of the way it's used. The style is so different. With that rich history with classical music that you're mentioning, do you find there's some difficulty in both keeping what's been pleasing for so many hundreds of years for the listener and also finding new ways to kind of push boundaries or experimenting with things? Oh yeah. That is a, that's actually a really big thing. Um, A really big consideration right now in the current modern classical field is there are a lot of really talented, great current composers out there writing great works but then they're actually competing against this history of classical music. Um, orchestras, you know, programming your usual Mozart and Beethoven works, because um, a lot of that is what people want to still hear. And it is really hard to get people to go out um, and see new works. So just as, as an example, I recently was very fortunate to be able to go to the Met Opera's opening concert uh, for this season, which was Terence Blanchard's new opera. Um, he is a jazz composer, um, but also, you know, writes classical works. Really talented, amazing composer. And it was it was the first opera that the Met has has programmed that was written by a black composer. And so just knowing that, it kind of blew my mind, like, wow, it's the Met's been around for like 200 years, and this is the first time. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's great that they're, you know, kind of changing and programming works by new composers, but there is that tradition that is still there that makes it hard for new works to really blossom and get people to hear them. 
um, because a lot of these well-established venues tend to program works like traditional classical works. Yeah, and I wonder what it is about that that makes it difficult for people to appreciate new music, in, specifically thinking about classical music, because I think it's the Rite of Spring, but this might be wrong. But what's the piece that when people first heard it, like everyone kind of got upset and were, were like actively angry because there was so much dissonance in it? Is that the Rite of Spring? or am I Yeah, that is the Rite of Spring. I mean, I'm sure it could have been other works too, but... Yeah, definitely. It was the, um, I believe it was the bassoon or was it a contrabassoon or an instrument that opens the whole piece in a really high register that's normally not played on that instrument. And people were like, what is that? (laughs) They didn't recognize what instrument it was. And it's beautiful, though. If you hear it, it's just such a beautiful melody. And And yeah, I think he kind of based a lot of that song, a a lot of that piece on tribal rhythms. So there's a lot of those kind of rhythms that the orchestra plays. And I guess, yeah, I guess people weren't used to hearing it at the time. And chaos ensued at the premiere, I've heard. (laughs) So yeah, I think it's just, um, there's always a sense of what people feel is the right kind of music. I don't know. It's I think it's it's something that's been in every era. Like every time, you know, like when jazz was introduced, that also experienced a lot of pushback from people who thought it was, you know, terrible, evil music. Um, the same thing with rock and roll, which just I think every era people have these preconceived notions of what music is supposed to be. But it's such a fluid language. It's always changing. And so, yeah, that's, it's a really good question. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I can really answer that. But yeah, I definitely see it happening. So your initial experience was getting into jazz, or I guess if we went back even further, what what were your earliest memories getting involved with music? Yeah, so it started uh, with classical, really, since I was uh, seven years old. I played the piano and I've always loved it. I never, I've never stopped loving practicing. Um, And I, I was very fortunate that my parents are really into classical music and took us all to concerts in the city every year. Um, So I grew up going to, you know, to see the New York Phil and going to the Met. Um, And that was just such a great experience to see it live it just kind of changes the way you you see classical music when you see it performed live versus on a recording. Um, it's such a big difference. And then I, when I was in high school, I got into jazz. My older brother had a bunch of jazz records, <laughs> and I loved them all, especially the Thelonious Monk records. And when I heard those, I was just mesmerized by his playing. His harmonies are so different. And I just thought, oh, I, I really have to learn how to play this kind of music. <laughs> like it just had it, such a cool feel and an amazing sound to me. So I started taking jazz lessons in high school and I absolutely loved it. And I kind of switched from classical to jazz and, and went to college for jazz piano. And so that's kind of how I got into jazz and why it's such a big influence now, because I I did end up studying that mostly in my college years. um, And that's influenced my composition. I think probably because of learning how to improvise kind of paved the way for, you know, arranging for jazz groups and then eventually composing for jazz groups and then composing for other projects. So moving into other genres and then now I'm kind of getting back into classical and just seeing that how like everything is connected, you know, all music kind of influences each other. So, but yeah, those are, those are my roots of how I started getting into jazz. So you mentioned you're into these jazz albums and you've always liked classical music. Was composition always an interest of yours or did that stem later from your interest in music? That actually stemmed later. I never thought of myself much as a composer when I was younger and even in my earlier college years. And then it wasn't really until 
I started having, you know, like jazz trios or quartets um, where some kind of arrangement is necessary. Um, Even if you're playing a standard, it's really common to kind of put your own twist on it, your own arrangement. And that that was kind of the start of composing, because then you really have to think creatively of, you know, how can you make the same song that people have been playing for for decades? How can you make it sound new and exciting or different? And then I kind of got into different techniques, which which kind of like fall in line with composing. Once I started doing that, I just kind of fell in love with it. I just loved that side of it. All of those like cr- trying to create new sounds was something that I just, I hadn't really experienced before. But doing that for jazz kind of opened it up for me to do it for other other projects. So you had this experience composing for jazz and then these different concert works. And then you've also in the past done some different compositions for films and TV. What was that experience like? I would actually say that those experiences were very, very different. <laughs> it's almost like night and day. I'm thinking more specifically about the like writing for television. I had a project where I was writing with with other composers. There was a head composer for some new TV productions. What we were doing was creating the library for the shows for the season. And it was such a rush schedule. And I think this is very common in television is when a production finally gets the green light to go ahead. Uh, there's very little time actually from when the episodes actually air <laughs> to when from when they get the green light. So I think we just, we had like very strict deadlines. And so that really changes the way that you write. You're kind of writing for something that you, do, you don't really have control over what happens on the screen. So you kind of have to write for a specific emotion so that they can use that later on and then everything, all these clips get tagged with different ways that they can help find things easily, like uh, suspenseful or this is a, a hopeful track. And so, um, and I think just because of the strict schedule, I didn't even have time to write anything down. I was literally just playing and improvising things into the computer and then mixing it and then sending it off. Um, and also there was the consideration of when, when they put something in, the music editor will, sometimes they'll need a very specific time for that clip. So they might need a 36 seconds. So they might need to stretch your music a little bit or they might need to cut it. So when you're writing, you know, you have to think in terms of like, can this section be looped? Can it easily be repeated? Can you cut it earlier and it still makes sense? So there's all of these considerations which go into it. And so you have a lot less control. Uh, You can't really develop anything too much. Like you can't bring it from one emotion to another emotion because it kind of has to stay within the same sphere, if you will, and kind of find other ways to develop it. So I found it, it was good for me. Like it helped me to write really fast, but it was also, um, I felt a little constrained doing it in that uh, we were given such strict guidelines and it was more the music editors, music supervisors, putting everything together that kind of created the palette of the background of the show, if you will. The difference sounds like it's the music in a film or a TV series is one piece of this grand puzzle. Whereas if you're composing a concert work, like people are there to hear the music and that's what they're there to do. Like you said, you're kind of beholden to serving the picture on screen and serving the story that's there. Obviously there's your own creativity goes into that. It's like you said, it sounds like it's a completely different wiring of your process. It's you're not approaching that the same way. Yeah, exactly. Um, You approach it from a completely different standpoint and different priorities. The priority is to get is to get the music done in time. (laughs) So even if there's something like, oh, I don't love that voicing or I don't love how, you know, maybe I could have written something better. There isn't really time to re re keep reworking something. You kind of just have to 
find a way to polish it off and, you know, send it in and then just start working on the new one. Um, And I've heard that with film before is that things are often still being edited and cut even till the very last minute. People kind of always feel like it's, it's not perfect, but you've got a deadline and that's, that's how it is. (laughs) Got to put it in. Not to say that there's no deadlines in concert music, but you do have that freedom to just take an idea and really develop it into something where, where it wants to go and you don't have that, those other constraints. How long will you spend composing a piece like uh, Shifting Pieces, for example, which I think, I think I saw when you sent me the file for that, the full piece is about three and a half minutes. Is that right? Yeah, it's about three and a half minutes. It's a process for me. It really takes me a long time. Uh, Different composers are are different. I have a friend who can pull an all-nighter and, you know, write something in a few days. (laughs) Um, I can't do that. I'm, I'm more of like, you know how they say like Beethoven always had, um, they would find his manuscripts with constantly things crossed out and just scribbles everywhere. That's more my style. Like I just, I'll, I'll write something and I'll just keep reworking it. I'll often keep cutting things and trying something else. I really try to hear it many, many times, whether it's in my head or if I'm playing it on the piano. So I'll often spend time and write something and then come back to it later and try to make sure the whole thing is flowing together. And the idea is, if I don't like hearing something multiple times, then other people aren't either. So I really try to make sure that I feel really happy about it. And I kind of, it it takes me a lot of time to rework things and, and think about it. So that piece in particular took me about two months. I mean, I was doing other work at the time as well, but generally a couple months to kind of get that, that all worked out. Yeah. So you hinted at my next question too, which was, so is it one of several pieces and how do you decide what you're working on on any given day? Yeah. I kind of try to focus on one piece um, at a block of time. So the the pieces I wrote for this past concert, um, they're all for solo piano. Um, I wrote three. Uh, One of them I wrote a year ago during COVID, actually, um, it took me a couple months to write that one. And then I wrote the the next one over the summer. And then the last one I wrote um, in one month in the fall. Uh, so they were all kind of different circumstances. Um, I kind of find just because it was for the same project, I kind of find that it's better for my mentality to kind of focus on one at a time. There are times when I, if I do have different projects going on at the same time, it gets kind of hard to split my brain between the two. So I I really do try to delve into one and kind of have that be my main focus before I switch to something else. And that's, you know, that's, that's just my process. I know a lot of people do do different ways, um, but that's what I find has been most helpful for me. And do you start each piece Uh, Well, I guess we already talked about how you start with, you know, you might be meeting with the performer or you're starting with the themes and stuff like this. But when it comes time to writing the actual notes down, are the first notes that you write the kind of theme of the piece that gets developed? Or do you start from the beginning and work through to the end kind of second by second? How does that part work? I usually start with the main theme, like the main idea. So in the very beginning, I I usually think of the main melody that I feel can be developed in in different ways, in many ways, um, if if I feel the melody is strong enough. And then when I'm going through and I keep writing, I'll often, maybe I'll think of another idea, but it doesn't quite fit right after the one I had just written. So I might write it down and put it aside and think, oh, maybe I can use that later on in the piece. And Sometimes I'll get different ideas that can sometimes be within the same piece. um, And I'll kind of connect them, you know, as like theme one, and then there's a theme two. Um, There's often transitional moments in the piece to go from one idea to another idea. 
And sometimes those transitional moments in and of themselves can be like another theme, whether it's like a chord progression or or something that changes the emotion of the song. Um, so I kind of try to think of everything I write as a theme in and of itself, like something that can be developed later on or introduced again in a different way. And I think that really helps to keep the piece cohesive so that when you listen from beginning to end, even if there's a new idea, you like, oh, I th- it feels comfortable like you've heard it before. Well, that's because I had something like that earlier on when you keep reintroducing the same themes, but in different ways, it really helps the listener to not feel disjointed, but to have it feel like a, a story arc, almost something that really connects the whole way through. So that's kind of what I try to think about when I'm actually writing the notes and trying to fit in what goes where. It's not always in consecutive order, but sometimes I end up juggling the things around a bit. Do you ever find pieces of a theme that, you know, might not be the main theme that you're developing in a piece? Do you find those that you explore those later in a different piece sometimes? Or do you pretty much keep those themes designated to their different works? Yeah, I sometimes they do actually um, don't make it into that work. But I do like it enough that I'll keep it uh, like I just I have a notebook of all this stuff and I kind of keep it in the notebook. When I get to a certain point, though, um, I transition from a notebook to the computer. So then I just kind of write everything into the computer. But before that is, yeah, kind of the idea phase in a notebook so that I can do that. If I find different themes, like I'll just try to write as many as possible, just keep writing ideas down. And then I might come back later and then see which which ones work the best, which ones I like the best. And if one never, never gets chosen for that piece and I like it, I'll, I'll keep it in the notebook and maybe come back to it later. And it could be a different song. It could be something else. This is like a handwritten notebook that you have? Mm-hmm. Yep. Very old school. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes actually when I'm stuck in my writing, I'll like I write mostly everything on the computer. I know one person I interviewed, actually, he writes his manuscripts by hand first and then puts it on the computer, which I just I'm like, my hand is cramping thinking about it. But uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll use a notebook when I'm kind of stuck, like it gets my brain thinking in a different way versus just typing it out on a word processor. Do you find a difference when you're handwriting the notes versus using whatever software you might use on a computer? Do you find different avenues of creativity on those two different mediums? Yeah, I I actually find that I'm a lot more open to new ideas when I'm writing, when I'm handwriting in a notebook, just on blank manuscript paper. And the reason is blank manuscript paper, like whenever I start writing something, I never write in a time signature or a key signature in the beginning of the piece. I just write it as I, as I hear it. And I don't, I really try not to think about key or form. I try not to get locked into anything from the beginning, but if you were to put it in a notation software, often those are like default settings that they, it, it doesn't default to like not having a time signature or hiding bar lines. So you kind of feel like locked in, like you have to write, you know, a certain number of beats every measure, unless you go in and change certain settings. But it, I find that a bit more restrictive that way. So I do like just having the open platform. Once I put it into the computer, it's like, okay, I've decided this is the key signature, this is the time signature. So that's sort of the transition for me. Now you also teach music. What is it specifically that you teach? Is it piano or different instruments, composing? What's all in your lessons? Yeah, so I teach piano um, and most of my students are kids. And I actually, I, I really love it. I teach mostly like classical style. And I also teach a little bit of composition Um, I have some young students who really like writing their own songs and get really creative in it. And I think that doing that, just seeing them rework things kind of helps me kind of see my own music journey and how it's it's all connected. It kind of takes me back to the basics, if you will, 
seeing how music, whether it's written for some really simple song or whether it's like something very complicated like Stravinsky or Mahler, it all has the same roots, the same ideas that make it work or not. And so being able to keep revisiting the basics of that just always brings me down to like the importance of music and and how it works as a language and how it speaks to to kids or you know even with simple songs or how it how it can speak to other people with very complex in a very complex way and outside of the technical kind of how to's and teaching something like that what are some of the core things that you find are important to instill into a student who is approaching music early in their life i think that well Yeah, you know, aside from technique, I think the most important thing that I try to get my students to do is to really connect with the music that they're playing. So I often make them sing, (laughs) even if they're they're a little hesitant or shy about singing. Um, Some of the songs have words or sometimes they make up words, but having them sing it and play it just gives this whole other connection to it. It's almost like being able to connect with the music is like an outer worldly experience, I think. Like it's like hiking and then you you get to the top and then there's this amazing view. It's this feeling you get from something that's outside of you, something that's bigger than you. And getting kids to reach that experience through their playing is I think the best thing that they can learn because giving them the tools to be able to do that kind of shows them the importance of music and how it can speak as a language, how they can convey their emotions and how they can get inspired through it as well. And how do you kind of remind yourself of that? Because I I think I always see the beauty in the craft and like what you're describing, how spectacular of an experience that it is. But at the same time, like when I'm like in the trenches of it, and I'm sure that this happens with your composing as well. It's like when you're really trying to, you know, do your editing or do this technical side of it, or you're in like the kind of more like drudgery part of it, it can be a lot, like it can kind of bring you down a little bit too. So I guess, how do you keep that bigger picture of how important music is to you in mind as you work? That's, I agree. That's something that happens to all of us. Um, I I think whenever that happens, and and it does happen a lot, (laughs) not going to lie. Um, I definitely have to take a step back, take a step away from what I'm working on to, to force myself to see the big picture. So I might actually just like leave the project and then come back to it a little later. But I, in the meantime, I'll probably try to do something completely different, like go on a bike ride or like, you know, go out and see a, a concert of new music or just maybe try to listen to an artist I've never heard before and try to get myself out of whether it was, maybe it like feels like a little box that I was in before and try to get myself out of it. And then I think when I come back to it, I do have a refreshed experience to kind of see the big picture of the work that I'm uh, writing. And that helps me to rework some little details sometimes is when I I can make a big picture and like a target. So this is where I'm getting to. And then that helps me to work the details a little bit better. There's actually a good quote I remember seeing at a, actually at a photography exhibit recently. Ruth Orkin is the photographer. She had once said, um, being a photographer is making people look at what I want them to look at. And I think that's like a really a great thing to think about is like, tell me see the big picture is when I see something or like feel something, I want others to experience that same feeling. So I think sometimes that's something also that I can kind of revisit to see the big picture of it is what is the overall feeling or emotion that I'm trying to convey And that can sometimes help me, help to bring me out of that, the trenches, so to speak. And it it makes it a lot more fluid for me. 
Well, thanks so much, Amy. It's been such a pleasure talking with you and getting to know the process behind your music and and why you create. Where can people hear, you know, besides the sample that we played at the beginning, where can people hear more of your work and how can they learn more about your music? Thanks, John. Um, I, I'm actually going to be recording some of those uh, piano pieces uh, very soon in the next few weeks. Um, and those were pieces that were premiered, again, performed by my friend Mavis Pan uh, at the National Opera Center in New York um, back in October. We're going to do some more uh, studio recordings of those. And I'll, I'll definitely post them on my website, which is Tanaka Studios NYC. Dot com, and they'll be up there probably, hopefully within a couple months, I think. Well, great. Thanks so much again. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cause of Craft. The clip at the beginning of the show was Shifting Pieces for Solo Piano by Amy Tanaka, performed by Mavis Pan Piano, recorded at the National Opera Center's Skorka Hall in New York City on October 31st, 2021. To listen to more of Amy's music, visit TanakaStudiosNYC.com. There you can find full recordings to her jazz compositions, concert works, and more. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider sharing with a friend and leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Both of these two simple things really help the show grow, and I appreciate your help spreading the word. Follow Cause of Craft on Instagram for the latest news and updates, including visual companions and clips for every episode. Thanks again for listening, and see you next week.